Good morning. Today is another lovely day of quarantine. Day two, no, three of a nice, lovely, sunshiny day. Today I'm going to be reading you chapter nine from 21 Balloons. Um, just to recap, near the end of the book, uh, the professor um, had just got done from the balloon merry-go-round, um, and he was a little dismissed that he was being ordered around by children because children were in charge of the merry-go-round. However, he had a really good time, and he ended up sleeping really well, apparently. All right, chapter nine, concerning the giant balloon life raft. Got pictures right down here. Looks like they're bottling in the water a little bit. Okay. Concerning the giant balloon by Fract. The next morning, I ate breakfast with my fellow Krakatoians at Mr. C's Chinese restaurant. I will tell you quite frankly, I have ha I have no idea what I ate at any of the meals on C Day. I'm not too partial on Oriental food. I don't even dare to ask what I was eating for fear that any accurate description or analysis would only add to the uneasiness with which I suffered through each meal. I noticed that many of the children toyed with their dishes and with equal apprehension. I used their method of eating some portions, which consisted of removing the toasted almonds from the top carefully with a fork and leaving the rest. Mr. F scolded me for this display of timidity and poor taste and told me to acquire an appreciation of good food, I should show a little more courage and will experiment. I assured him that I had a great desire to become accomplished gourmet while living under the restaurant government, but preferred to arrive at this gradual stages over a long period of time. That means he wanted to take his time getting used to the food. Mr. F. asked me what I wanted to do after breakfast. I told him that being on the island in the position of a perpetual guest with no work to do, I was fast getting to think of living in terms of holidays back home. On a hot Sunday in San Francisco, like this sea day of the month of lamb in Krakatoa, I would most probably go to some beach and do some swimming. I suggested a swim with Mr. F. He thought this would be a fine idea, so we put on bathing suits and bathrobes and made our way through the outer fringe of the jungle to a nicely cleared, fine coral beach. I had arrived in Krakatoa on the afternoon of A Day. It was now the morning of C Day. In that short time, I had become quite used to walking out, excuse me, walking about in the morning landscape. I was amazed how fast I had acquired all of my mountain legs and felt rather proud of myself. The little beach looked very funny to me when I stopped and thought about it and compared to it to the beaches back home. For here, the ocean was quite calm and the beach was going up and down. How's the swimming here, I asked. Excellent, said Mr. F. You'll see. I wadded in the water up to my waist and, and there experienced a delightful sensation. The sand beneath me rose up to the surface of the earth until I found my feet out of the water and then lowered me back down to the water up to my neck. I stood in one place and went in and out of the water, spending a few seconds in the blazing tropical sun and then being dunked again up to my neck in clear, cool water up and down, in and out, without having to move all around from the place of standing. Mr. F. had wadded out a little deeper in the water than I had and seemed to be enjoying being entirely dunked upon over his head at the earth's lowest drop, and then rising with the earth until he was only up to his knees in water. Once the temporary, te once when temporarily up to my waist, I dove in for deeper water to do a little swimming. I hadn't gone very far when I felt the sand rise beneath me and lift me by the stomach out of the water. A most peculiar feeling. Mr. F. explained to me that it was necessary to wade out quite far to do some good swimming. You should walk out far enough so that you are up to your waist in water when the surface of the earth beneath, beneath you is at its highest rising point. I did this, the half walking and half dog paddling, and when I was far enough out, enjoyed a good swim. Back on the beach, Mr. F and I decided to take a sun bath. He told me that he had found it best to let the sun, to let the surface of the earth roll you around when it moved and not to try to lie in any one position. We did this and we were nicely toasted on all sides by the hot sun. I was enjoying a most pleasant morning and decided right away to make this a daily habit. The night before, I had borrowed an atlas from Mr. F and I looked up Krakatoa 
in it before I go before going to sleep, I found that it was situated in the Sunder Strait between Sumatra and Java, and that it was about twenty five miles from both of these to a whole huge island. Islands. Looking at the map and trying to trace the path of my voyage in the globe, I was amazed to see how much I had missed on my trip. I must have flown between Mindano and the southern end of the Philippines and the Celeb Islands over the Celeb, that might be Celebs, Celeb Sea. I must have flown over Barano one whole night, narrowly missing mountains and being at times very close to the ground. I shuddered when I tried to imagine the rude awakening I would have had if the globe had struck a mountain top in Borno while I was perfectly asleep on my inflated mattress. The Pacific Ocean is the biggest body of water in the world. Krakatoa, which was only 18 square miles in size, was one of the smallest islands in the Pacific. I set up to the island of Asia, the world's biggest continent. Completely missed many enormous islands, traveled thousands of miles over water, and landed on this tiny piece of land. Had a sea captain set out across the Pacific Ocean for, let's say, China, and missed it by a few thousand miles and landed instead in Krakatoa? He would have been stripped of his commission and had his ship taken away from him. But to balloonists, stories such as mine are typical, and, a balloon tri and balloon trips are only considered unusual if you arrive within 100 miles or so of your planned destination. It was I was thinking of how delightful this was, of freedom and surprise of balloons of freedom and surprise, surprise of balloon travel, and the balloon merry-go-round I had taken such a fantastic trip on after, that afternoon. Then it occurred to me that the balloon merry-go-round was a pretty big affair. It had seemed to me that it should be visible when up in the air on a clear day from either Java or Sumatra. I asked Mr. F about this while we were basking in the sun. We don't worry about that much. There are several reasons why. One of them is the balloon, mer balloon merry-go-round is painted sky blue and therefore isn't really visible from too great a distance. Another is that the balloon merry-go-round never goes over five or six miles on its longest trips, and that doesn't bring it very close to either Java or Sumatra. Then, too, the mountain has a reputation for belching forth strange things, and the whirling balloons and boats look quite like a big blue smoke ring from a distance. But there is very, but there is this very important reason why we don't worry about it being seen. In 1877, our second year here, so this was placed a lot farther back than I thought it was. In 1877, our second year here, the mountain was so violent that it scared the people living here on the shores of the Sunder Strait in both Java and Sumatra so much that they moved their homes inland about 25 miles on both sides, on both islands. The whole the whole of Krakatoa was violently rocked from end to end. Waves were formed on the Sunder Strait, traveling out towards the island as a center. Giant waves, which swept into the shores of Java and Sumatra, completely inundating many homes. Let sink them in. The noise was formidable, and the waves caused so much damage that the people moved away from the tips of the islands in a great, in a great haste. We have reason to believe that no one dares to live within radius of 40 of 50 miles from us. Great heavens, I exclaimed. How did such an explosion affect you when you were living right here on the island? It was quite bad. Many of the huts we lived in at the time collapsed like card houses. No one was hurt much, though many of us were knocked unconscious or had our wind knocked out from being thrown abruptly to the ground. The noise of the explosion wasn't too bad on the island. I suppose the fact that we were right on the island made the noise more bearable. If you stand straight, near, or on a large artillery piece when it's fired, you are much less bothered by the noise than if you were 50 feet away. We picked ourselves up, helped those who needed help, and went to about business of rebuilding our homes. This brought up another point that had been puzzling me. Why? I asked Mr. F. Do people live here on top of this dormant volcano? With a handful of diamonds, you could live a life of lavish ease and comfort in another country. Your question is a puzzler, and there is really no logical answer to it. It suggests a series of other questions of exactly the same nature. For instance, why doesn't a millionaire in any other country consider himself rich enough to retire? Why does he try to make another million? Why do tycoons and several millions of dollars try to make a billion? A sum so huge they couldn't possibly spend it all in a lifetime. As long as our diamond mines are kept secret here... We, the 20 families at Krakatoa, match the rest of the world in wealth. 
The diamond mines have a particular magnetic effect on us. We couldn't live happily in any other country. We would be haunted with the unbelievable dream of this unheard wealth back on the island. So we got a picture right here. It looks like when the island blew up and shook everybody. Kind of shows everybody falling over. Having the wind knocked out of them as they were talking about. But we can't take our diamonds. That is all of our diamonds to another country without destroying their value. We are slaves of our own piggishness. We have locked ourselves in a diamond prison. On the other hand, we are very happy here. And I suppose the fascination of knowing that we are each, that each one of us, and I suppose the fascination of knowing that we are each one of us richer than the combined Mattises, Naboobs, and Crossy of history enters into the Krakatoan spell which keeps us here. But this spell, as you call it, it, seems to be a little unreasonable to me for the simple reason that it changes a will of human nature that is as far greater than we will than we will be rich. This being obviously the will to live. How can you live happily here under the constant threat of being blown into the sky? Now that I think of it, this whole island is like a turkey stuffed with nitroglycerin. The surface of the earth here, which is right at this moment moving us gracefully up and down is obviously activated by molten lava. A crack in the Earth's surface and the cold waters of the Pacific would rush in. Imagine what would happen then. Cold water coming suddenly in contact with molten lava. This hollow rumbling shell would suddenly find itself like a covered kettle of boiling water on stove. The resulting steam would cause pressure enough to blow the top right off the whole island. No one could survive such an explosion. What good way? What good would your diamonds do you then? We're all only too much aware of this possibility. It troubles me just to hear you mention it. We have come to look upon it this way. If it should happen, with the speed with which you have just described it, nobody here would have time to think or know what was happening to him. It would mean a painless death. However, if we have a warning, which we all somehow expect to have, there is a quick escape from Krakatoa. Give us a little, um, given as little time as ten minutes to get off the island, we'll all be safe and on our way to some other country. This escape and the fact that Krakatoa has been here an uncalculated length of time without blowing up makes living here under the ever-present threat of extinction possible. What is this escape, I ask? Do you keep the freighter always steamed up and ready to go? I would take the freighter... It would take the freighter longer than ten minutes to leave here, said Mr. F. It's not that. It's the other invention I promised to show you yesterday. This is an invention we all worked carefully on for many months, starting right after the big explosion in 1877. Our lives deepened, uh, depended on it, but due to its huge size and its motivating power, we are all unable to try it out. There is no reason why it shouldn't work, and when I say this, I mean no reason on paper. Its maiden voyage will have to prove its worth. It's a flying platform, a huge platform big enough to take us all swiftly into the air within 10 minutes of a warning from the mountain. A platform capable of lifting 20 families of four, I asked. This makes, chi it makes child play of flying carpets. How do you hope to get it off the ground? With balloons, answered Mr. F. This idea appealed to me immensely. The idea of the lives of 80 people being entrusted to such a frickle and an unpredictable traveling companions as balloons was quite frightening but thoroughly enjoyable. You are all prepared to risk your lives in a balloon contraction. I like this very much. A little while back, I was starting to think Krakatoa as being greedy, calculating, and traditionally dull billionaires. Now I find you are incurable romantics. Tell me. How can such a massive weight as, as that of 20 families be lifted off the ground? I beg your pardon, said Mr. X. We are not risking our lives on any foolhardy covenants. The balloon platform must work. It's got to work. I can't help. It can't help working. Look, I'll show you. I walked over to where Mr. F was lying, sat down beside him, and watched him as he sketched the platform in the sand. He made a bird's eye view of it and drew the 20 balloons, the 20 balloons around its outside edge. It was rectangular in shape. He started writing numbers in the sand. I don't know how much the actual platform weighs by itself, he said. 
It's made of the lightest pine wood in the, wor in the world, imported by us especially for this purpose from South America. It is made of light beams, and the floorboards are laid with spaces between them for greater lightness. The balustrade around the platform, remember balustrade is a railing around it, is of hollowed wood. The woodwork couldn't possibly have been made lighter. Before I tell you about the balloons, I want to make it clear that I'm going to give you the figures in the round numbers with the margin with a margin of error, all in the favor of the success of the machine. Thus, the lifting power of the balloon will be calculated a little less than it actually is, and the weight and the weight we are carrying will be will be computed as heavier than it actually will be. There is really no accurate way of planning balloon inventions. Too much depends on the atmospheric conditions, the purity of the hydrogen used, and weather conditions. I will give you the roughest of figures. I understand, I said. The balloon platform is lifted by 10 large balloons of 32,400 cubic feet each, and then 10 balloons half as big as the larger ones of 16,200 cubic feet each. The larger balloons will fly higher than the smaller ones, which will be situated in the spaces between the larger ones, thus alternating around the platform. One large, one high, and one small, one low, etc. It has a little bit of a picture of what he's talking about right there. You can see balloons. Okay, so this big one was the 34,000 cubic feet. This one was the one that's half its size. I see, I said. The total hydrogen needed to fill all 20 is 486,000 cubic feet. Free hydrogen has a lifting power of roughly 70 pounds per 1,000 cubic feet. The 20 balloons have a combined lifting strength of 45,360 pounds. How much do you figure the 80 people will weigh? Well, he said, writing down more figures in the sand. If you divide the 80 people by sexes, half are women. If you divide them by generations, half are children. 130 pounds per person is a safe figure under these circumstances. <laughs> the 80 people will weigh 10,400 pounds. But let me see, how much do you weigh? In the roughest of numbers I answered, I weigh 180 pounds. All right, 180 pounds. All right, said so Mr. F. That makes 10,580 pounds leaving 34,780 pounds over to take care of the total weight of the platform. I agreed that all of this sounded very reasonable, but one thing bothers me. I said, how do you get the balloons filled with hydrogen and hydrogen in the platform off the ground in 10 minutes? That was our most difficult problem. Come with me. I'll show you the platform and how we think we have solved the question of the fastest getaway. I put my bathrobe on and followed him through the f jungle fringe. After a good long walk, we came to a clearing, which was far away from the mountain as possible, to get to the island. The huge platform was situated here. I remember having seen it from the balloon merry-go-round the day before. I had thought then, seeing it from the air, that it was some sort of outside dancing floor with a bandstand in the middle. What I thought was the bandstand turned out to be a large steel cylinder. Mr. F showed me four great wooden vats, one with the ground, one on the ground near each side of the balloon platform. There were hoses leading from the vats to the balloons, and what Mr. F described as pitchfork connections. The hoses were large and single as they lay in the vats, and then branched off into smaller hoses, each one attached to a balloon. This is how we believe we have solved the platform of a quick takeoff, he said, compressed Compressed hydrogen, each of these vats contains 300,000 cubic feet of hydrogen, compressed at 1,600 pounds to the square inch. Right here, we have a picture of where the hydrogen is kept, how it's connected, and then you see it coming down through this tube, okay? And then it goes in through there and heads up to the individual balloons. The hydrogen is kept in steel cylinders, which are submerged in water in the vats to keep leakage down to a minimum and keep the hot rays of the sun from direct contact with the cylinders. In the event of an emergency, we will all rush to the platform, jump on, and each family will stand by a balloon. The big valves on the four vats will be turned on full force. Each family will have to see that it's a, 
will see that its balloon is carefully handed so that the tremendous rush of hydrogen into it won't cause any tears, rips, or snarls. The smaller balloons will fill first. There is a lever near each balloon which controls the valve allowing gas to enter it. When the small ones are three quarters full, their valves will be shut off. Shutting off the smaller balloon valves will speed up the filling of the big ones since they will be receiving all of the pressure. Mr. F then picked up one of the hoses and showed it to me. There was a sort of ball and socket connection in each hose. He explained that it looked like a 150 pound pole to separate the hose at this connection. Each hose has a connection such as this, he explained. 20 hoses make a total of 3,000 pounds. The balloon platform isn't tied down with ropes before takeoff, and it's held down only by these hoses. Gas rushes into the balloons until the platform rises, and there is a 3,000 pound pull on the 20 hoses. The platform then tears itself from the hose connection and leaps into the air as if it was given a huge boost. There is a valve on the ball end of each ball and socket connection. It allows gas to be forced into the balloon, but prevents gas from escaping when the connection in the vats is broken. When the balloon platform is in the air, the hoses will be pulled in and attached to hoses from the smaller compressed hydrogen tank on the platform itself. It is the hydrogen on the platform and the flights will be controlled. What he's saying there is that the balloons, they're all going to be, instead of being tied down by ropes, they're kind of tied down by the tubes that are putting hydrogen into the um, balloons. So as the hydrogen is going in, the platform is going to slowly rise and rise and rise. And once enough pressure is built up in the hydrogen, it's just going to pop off leave and rip off all of the string, all of the uh, hydrogen hoses. How can you control the flight of the platform? By adding hydrogen to the balloons, we can go higher um, to a certain extent. By detaching the hoses from the tanks on the platform and releasing hydrogen from the balloons, we can make the platform descend. Um, where we go as usual le is left entirely up to the winds. However, since we carry our own hydrogen supply, there's no reason why with any sort of wind and a minimum of luck, we can't travel the tremendous distance. How do you keep the platform level? We plan to do that in much the same way as we keep the balloon merry-go-round level. Only the process will be reversed. We have no desire to take long trips in the balloon merry-go-round, so we keep it level by releasing hydrogen from the high side until it's even with the low side. On the balloon platform, we will add hydrogen to the low side and bring it up a level with the high side so that the platform as a whole will gain altitude instead of descending. Each family will stand near its balloon on the platform, thus distributing the weight e fairly evenly. There is a lever near each balloon, as I have already shown you, which controls the gas going into the balloon. The boy in each family will control the lever because of his greater experience with the balloon merry-go-round. When his balloon is a little lower than the others, he'll add more gas. It will add more gas to it and bring it up with them. I walked around the platform. The floorboards were springy underfoot, and you could see grass underneath through the spaces between them. I tried to imagine this huge floor in flight, looking through the boards at the city underneath. How frightening and incredible it would be to be moving through space as such a huge piece of construction with 80 other people. The balloons were carefully folded and under tarpaulins. I took a look at several of them. They were magnificent, made of beautiful rubberized silk, and each balloon was painted mainly different iridescent colors. I tried to picture the reaction of people in other countries if they were to suddenly look up in the sky and see the, see the balloon platform. It is white laced floorboard by graceful bolstrade over which we were leaning the rich clay cloth Krakatoans. Got a view of what they're looking at? You got the ball straight right here, and the balloons and little deflated piles around them. The 20 brilliant balloons above the above, and the frightening silence with which such a large airship would seem suddenly to make its appearance. There is no noise in balloon travel, and any other form of travel, you are warned by some sort of noise of the approach of whatever the co conveyance. Even ships cause a ripple of waves in the calmest of waters. 
Balloons are silent except for a rare occasion where you might possibly hear the ghostly whistle of wind through the ropes. There is no nicer way of traveling than in some form of lighter-than-air aircraft. The balloon platform would certainly make a delightful, attractive appearance if it would have to fly over any foreign country, I remarked. Its appearance played a big part in its planning, said Mr. F. It wasn't really necessary to go to all the trouble we did in making this handsome hollow carved wooden bolstrade, or to put so much thought, work, and time into the painting of the balloons. A lighter, simpler bolstrade and plain balloons would have made the platform fly just as well. We should have had to land in other countries. Um, if we should have to land in other countries, we want to be welcomed as extraordinary visitors who have gained, who have gallantly an announced their arrival, rather than be suspected of being invaders in some sort of aerial Trojan horse. By the way, have you a parachute? Of course not, I answered. I threw everything overboard on the globe. I didn't carry one anyway. I didn't feel I needed one. Each family here has a family parachute. Another invention of ours. A family parachute is so built as to keep a family of four together during descent. It is, isn't it possible to land on the balloon platform? Hardly so, said Mr. F. In the first place, it would be hard to find enough level space in which to land such a huge aircraft. And in the second place, it wouldn't be possible to deflate the balloons fast enough to prevent the wind from blowing it and dragging it across the countryside. We would have to deflate them slowly in order to make a reasonably smooth landing. Before we would be able to collapse them, the wind would drag us off, ripping the platform into splinters and endangering our lives. We wouldn't dare risk a landing in this. We plan to jump off, picking our countries and spots with care. If we ever have to take a trip on it, Professor Sherman... I would advise you to get a parachute as soon as you possibly can. How can I get one in Krakatoa, I asked. See Mrs. M. She and her husband designed and made the family parachutes. I'm sure she'll have enough silk left over to make you an ordinary one. We went over to Mrs. M.'s Moroccan house, and I told Mrs. M. my problem. Why, certainly, she said. I can make you a parachute, but it'll take me about two weeks. But then I doubt if you'll be needing it before then. I hope I hope not anyway, she said laughing. Of course not, I said. Take your time. There's no rush at all. Oh. That is the end of chapter 9. We got a little sneak preview of chapter 10. Looks like somebody's freaking out. I don't know. We'll have to find out when we go to read chapter 10. For now, this is the end of chapter 9 in 21 Balloons. I hope you'll join me for the next video. Thank you.